right? So uh, I'll turn it over to John. He's going to talk to you about communication. Great. So. Thanks so much for having me, Rob. It is a pleasure to be with you all here today. Uh, excited to hear about what's going on in this classroom. Rob shared a lot of things with me about what's going on here and some of your aspirations and goals and that type of thing, just kind of in a broad sense. Uh, but uh, I do want to focus today on communication from the leader. And so I, had a, I just want to kind of start with a question. And the question is this, uh, when you think about communication within the context of leadership, and, and please forgive me, I am from the South, and so I, I have a little bit of a Southern drawl, I'm sure. Uh, so it might take your ear just a minute to, to kind of get in tune with it. But nonetheless, if you think about communication within the context of leadership, what comes to mind? So this is the interactive part, and I hope that the entire hour will be interactive as well. So communication within the context of leadership, what comes to mind? Yes, sir. Guidance. Guidance, and how so? Um, just kind of like giving clear instruction on like, here's what can be done, here's what you're doing well, and this okay. is what I'd like to see better. Clear instruction, I like that, that's good. All right, how about uh, anyone else? Yes, yeah, yes sir. Uh, feedback. Feedback. Tell me about that. Uh, so, you know, after you've gotten clear instruction and say whoever you kind of delegated to do that finishes and you kind of follow up with them and tell them what they did, any feedback, good or bad. And that's important. Why? Uh, it's important that they know how, where they stand with the standard. That's right. Where they stand. I mean, how many of you like to give feedback, especially good feedback? Yeah, I mean, we can all acknowledge that, right? Now, how many of you enjoy getting bad feedback? Okay, two, three of you. Okay. <laughs> so Lee Cockrell, he was a former uh, former um, executive at Walt Disney World. He used to say that feedback is a gift. Feedback is a gift. You have to receive it like that. Whether it's good or bad, it's a gift. And let me just tell you, you can learn a lot from even bad feedback as far as the way it comes to you. Now, uh, probably not in the, uh, say, the manner in which it's presented. You know, sometimes that can be challenging. But sometimes if it's something that you're not wanting to hear, you might perceive that as being bad feedback. But actually, it's helpful feedback because that helps you to correct yourself, to course correct in some sense. So we've got clear instruction. We have feedback. What else? Yes, sir. Yeah, um, selling your vision is part of the communication. Yes, yeah, yeah. So kind of vision casting. Okay. Have you ever heard someone cast a vision that was so compelling that you were like, I want to work for this person, or I want to follow that person. Anybody? Yeah. Anybody want to share who that person might be? Yes. Um, my high school volleyball coach was just so like impactful on like her whole thing was she wanted to create like good people to go out into the world. Like she wasn't just trying to like coach you as a volleyball player. Like she wanted you to be a good human being. Yeah. Going out into the world. Did you play volleyball? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, uh, do you still stay in touch with this coach? Yeah, 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 that's exactly right. A lot of times that's what happens. When you have a visionary coach or a coach that really invests in you, you most likely are gonna stay in touch with them for some reason, and most likely it's, it's just the fact that you resonate with what they say, they challenge you to be better, and, and you want to continue to get better. Any other things when it comes to communication from the leader? What uh, expectations, what you hope to see, what you hope to, hope to hear? So we've got a, at least a good uh, kind of working uh, framework here. We'll talk a little bit about these things today. When you saw that we were going to be talking about communication today, did you have any questions that you're like, I really want to ask this question as it pertains to communication from a leadership, in a, a leadership context? Any questions that you can kind of think of or that you thought about that might be important? And that's okay if you don't. That's quite all right. They may come as we go. And so, as again, I do want this class to be very interactive, and so I hope that you'll stop me and ask you know, questions along the way as I kind of share this story. So, uh, as Rob shared, I have worked, uh, I worked for the Walt Disney Company for nine years, and one of the great privileges that I had was working for Disney Institute. Now, Disney Institute was the, was the, advisory and training arm of the company. So we more or less did advisory work for outside companies 
They were interested in learning about how Disney does business. That was more or less what, what, what we did. So we had general enrollment courses that we had uh, on, on site there, both at Walt Disney World and also over in Disneyland. And then, of course, we had clients that we traveled to uh, quite a bit as well and worked with directly on, on helping them, helping advise them on how they can improve their business strategy. So that was more or less what we, what we did. And that was a that was a tremendous a tremendous opportunity in my life to get to do that. Has anybody ever been to Walt Disney World, by the way? Oh yeah, a lot of you. All right, great. So, um, what was different about the experience that you that you had, maybe from another entertainment venue? Anybody like to share? Yes. Um, I really like the fireworks show at the end. Yeah. Um, how the castle lights up. Um, yeah, it's just the rides and the. Like people, like, oh, home characters, but like the people, they're like really intimidated with the character that they're portraying. Okay. Yeah, yeah. They, I mean, they were all in, right? Yeah. <laughs> they were 100% committed. And you know, they do that, the fireworks show every night. Yeah, you it's, know? Super nice. it, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. It's absolutely amazing. And you think about just the, the level of excellence that mm -hmm. Disney puts into not only a fireworks show, mm -hmm. but also the character, whether it's characters mm -hmm. or what we called cast members, that's what we call our employees for cast members. Um, again, it was always excellent. Any other experiences that you had at Disney that, that really kind of resonated with you? Yes. So I went to Disneyland in that world, but basically like the same thing where I was like, the characters were really like involved with you. Yeah. And you kind of like really just had like a nice relationship built from like little moments while mm -hmm. you were there. Yeah, yeah, especially the, what we would call the face characters. So that would be like a princess you know, or, or something like that. Yeah, they're, they're um, very personal, if you will. All right, maybe one more, one more experience. Yes, sir. Um, actually, just the class I just came from, we were talking about the um, the visual tricks that Disney uses to make the space feel so much bigger. Yeah. Um, just like how the scale of the castle yeah. and the higher floors are actually much smaller, but it makes you feel very immersive. Yeah, it's called forced yeah, perspective. Forced, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Yes, what sir. Class was that? Um, it's a VR class, VR and oh, in design. So, okay. nice. We're talking about visual tricks, and yeah, designs and stuff. Yeah. So you know, when you think about all these things that you got to enjoy, there was actually a communication strategy that was behind that, right? I mean, you can't just you just can't dress someone up and send them out there and, and expect them to do everything just right. No, they have to be trained, they have to be taught, they have to be coached, they have to you know all of these things things have to take place. But those expectations have to be communicated. And one of the things that Disney does really, really well is they communicate really well what they're all about before you're ever hired with them. Before you're ever hired with them. If you ever look at any of the ads or the recruiting ads for Disney, they're telling you exactly what they're about. They're about pixie dust, they're about princesses, they're about magic, you know, they're about all those things. And if that doesn't resonate with you, then most likely that's not a great place for you to go to work for. And so they're being very clear is that this is who we are and this is what we do and this is how we do it. And then through the recruiting process, again, that, that expectation is set, that, that expectation of excellence is established, and you kind of know that through the entire process. And when you go into your first couple of training days, uh, which really amounts to a few weeks overall, uh, you're, you're, you go through um, what Jim Collins in his book, Good to Great, would call an indoctrination process. Indoctrination process. And that indoctrination process is basically, it is, it is an immersive experience that you're going to go through as a brand new cast member to learn what it means to work at Disney. Because our guests have expectations as to what they're going to experience when they come to a Disney park or a Disney resort. And as you go through that immersive exp experience, that also gives you one last opportunity to decide this isn't for me or this is exactly where I want to be. This is where I want to be. So when I went to work uh, at, at Disney, I was absolutely fascinated with their communication, their communication strategy. As a matter of fact, I couldn't, I couldn't believe the scale of communication uh, of that communication strategy. Uh, everywhere you went, everywhere you, you went, you could not escape what they were trying to tell you. 
Now, one of the things that Disney cast members, every employee that works at Disney is guided by is something that uh, was once called the four key basics. Now they, they, now they call it the five key basics. And so, as you probably noted on uh, my bio, uh, Rob mentioned that I kind of talk about uh, Disney leadership from a legacy perspective. And so that was during my time, the time that I worked at Disney, so which means that, you know, some things have changed since I've been there. I've only been gone three years, but a lot of change. A lot of things have changed. And those four key basics at the time, uh, they were the service guidelines that were guiding principles for our employees to understand how they were to execute excellence each and every day. It was also how they understood they were going to execute the purpose of creating happiness for our guests, all right? And they were very simple. It was uh, courtesy. They were, being, they were Well, actually, it started with safety. So safety was the first thing. Every year they were going to make sure that the environment was safe. Uh, courtesy, uh, they're going to be sure that they talk to people in a friendly way, that they engage guests of all ages in a, in a very friendly way. Uh, show was the other thing. Everything was kept nice and clean. That Those fireworks show, shows were perfect every night. They were exactly the same. A guest could... Uh, come in one week and see it and expect to see the exact same show, you know, three months uh, later. And then the last thing was efficiency. And everything ran very smooth, you know, um, and that was that also kind of handled some of the finance side of things. Those four service principles are what guided cast members in delivering service day in and day out. And so you saw that just pl placard everywhere, every bulletin board, every newsletter, every magazine that was printed, everywhere you went, you saw those four key basics present. They were talked about in meetings, they were talked about in opening meetings, closing meetings, midday meetings. Uh, you carried a little card around in your pocket. You had it with you everywhere. And as a matter of fact, through the process, you had to sign off that you understood what those service basics were. It was kind of like an acknowledgement that this is how we're going to do business. This is how I'm going to execute my job each and every day. So that was just one way. Now, where I saw it on a, say, a larger scale was when I was working down at uh, Disney Springs. Disney Springs. Now, does anybody know what Disney Springs was called prior to Disney Springs? You may not even know what Disney Springs is. Downtown Disney. It was called Downtown Disney. And uh, if you didn't know that, then you wouldn't know that there were three other iterations or three other names uh, to that marketplace area uh, down on Lake Buena Vista. The point is, is this, is that when I, when I came to work there, I was part of really more or less a change management team. We were transitioning from downtown Disney to Disney Springs. Now, how many of you are like lifelong Disney people? Like this is the, the, I've always loved Disney, always gone to Disney. Anybody in the room like that? Maybe one. Okay, yeah. So, you, so for you, have you ever read the book Who Moved My Cheese? No. Okay, that's a great, that's another great book, great leadership book that you should read. Uh, and classic. and how to deal with people. Very, it's a classic. Yes, for sure. Um, but ultimately, what happens is is this: when you start changing things at, at a Disney park. Things that people grew up going to and attractions that they rode when they were little, you know, and then you, you change it. You have moved their cheese. And there's a lot of pain and angst when you start moving people's cheese. A lot of emotion involved. And so now we're not just changing a name, but we're also managing people's emotions. And that's the thing about communication. Communication has a lot to do with emotion. You think about even just some of the things that we've talked about here, every one of these things are tied into emotion in some way. You're going to have an emotional interpretation of each one of these things. And so communication is important. My wife tells me the way that I talk to my children is important because if I talk to them with a harsh tone, they're going to interpret it as me being mean, even if I'm not being mean. So somehow I've got to figure out a way to lighten it up. Or if I start asking them questions, you know, and, and it's just kind of part of my job is to ask questions. And so I don't always ask that with a lot of, you know, fluffiness or pixie dust or anything like that. 
And so all of a sudden there, there's this interpretation. Maybe I'm in an interrogation, you know? And so you feel that way. So emotions are involved with communication. And so as we're, as we're looking at making this transition from downtown Disney to, to the new Disney Springs, we knew we were going to be moving a lot of people's cheeks. And a lot of people were not going to be very happy about that. Now, thinking about that, who are the people that are not going to be happy about it? Who do you think I'm talking about? <clears throat> yes? Visitors. Okay, visitors or guests. Who else? Might be who you might not think. The employees. The employees. Some of those cast members have worked at downtown Disney since it opened. So you're messing with their house. This is their home. This is all they've ever known. And now you're, you're changing something about that. And so when you start to change something like that, there's emotions involved. And so you want to make sure that, you know, there is clear instruction, there's great feedback, and there's vision casting, certainly. All of those things have to be involved, but it was much more than that. So when we, when we think about uh, this, I'll try and work through some of this. This is very basic. This is a basic communication strategy. We talk about the who. We talk about the what. We talk about the when. We talk about the where. And we talk about the how. All right, and so in most things, in most things, when we are, say, planning an event, an event of some sort, we use every one of these to let people know when we're going to be doing something, right? But we're going to look at it hopefully a little bit differently with you today. Because in this, in this sense, we're talking about the who, and we're talking about a lot, of, not the band, but the, the people that are involved. There are lots of different people groups. So you've got an executive committee that might be involved. You have a steering committee that's going to be involved. You may have uh, upper management that's involved, you know, in some way. Here, you may have middle management involved. And so you've got lots of M&Ms in here like that. And then you might have your uh, frontline um, employees. And so this is a lot of who's. Welcome to Whoville. This is, they're all going to be right here. And these are people that we have to think about. What is it that they need to know? Because the information for each one of these people groups is all going to be different. What the front line, what the front line here is going to need to know is probably going to be different than the executive committee. And quite frankly, the executive committee is going to know some things that maybe the front line doesn't know. Maybe the bigger picture, you know, about the, the entire scope and the entire plan, but the front line, they don't need to know those things. And so that's the what. And so that's what you're thinking about is what is it exactly that each one of these groups of people need to know? And it's all going to be different, but there will be some commonality or a common thread that, that'll, that'll flow through all these groups, all of these groups. And so that's the what. The when is also important. Anybody familiar with what a Gantt chart is? Okay, I see heads chart, uh, moving. So that's good. So you think about, you've got a timeline here. Let's just call it January to December. And you got everything in between, all right? So a Gantt chart, basically, it's used in construction primarily, all right? But basically, when you're, doing, when you're thinking about it within the context of, con uh, of, of communication, each one of these people are going to need to know something. So executive committee is probably going to need to know something the entire duration of the project from start to finish. All right? Uh, maybe your upper management is, going to, is not going to pick up in January where the project began, but they may pick up here in March, and that's when they start getting information. So all their information picks up and goes from here. And then you have you know, some of your middle management. Okay, well, they're, they're going to pick up somewhere in here, and that's when they're going to start getting information. All the while, all the while, everybody's getting different bits and pieces of information. But the important thing is, is that they're getting what's vital to them. One of the things that, as I travel around, I talk with people all the time, working with uh, different companies and uh, you know, doing interviews with employees at the front line, all the way up the executive ladder. A lot of times people say, 
You know, John, no one, talk, no one tells me anything. No one tells me nothing. I, I didn't know. I didn't even know we were doing that, you know, type thing. Has anybody ever been in that position at work? Yeah, how did that make you feel? It did not feel good. Yeah, you're like, mm -mm. no, it did not feel good. It does not feel good when you don't know anything. Uh, we, Rob and I were out the other night. Uh, I'm not going to say the name of this uh, establishment, but he said that they closed down. They didn't notify any of the employees, just put a sign on the wall, and that was it. So people showed up for work that day, and that was the first they found out that the business had closed. Permanently. Permanently, yeah. <laughs> not just a temporary health you know, department closure. No, this is, this is people's jobs. It's terrible, right? So communication is absolutely critical and very, very critical for a, a leader to be communicating to their people because it's ultimately what demonstrates that you care. I mean, you can very easily connect care with communication. If you care about your people, you talk with them. You know things about them. That, that, that's one of the things that, you know, not every leader at Disney was like this, I can tell you this, but there were, there were several that were. And they knew every single person that worked in their department, plus some. And not like just knew of them, knew them by name. And not just knew them by name, but, but knew what they were dealing with. And ask questions about their family. That takes leadership to a whole other level. And, and it takes care to a whole other level as well. That's just a sidebar when it comes to communication. Care is, is very, very important. The where. This is kind of a fun part right here, the where. There are lots of places to demonstrate demonstrate um, our, our community are lots of places to communicate so maybe a large space might be a town hall that was one of the things that we did a lot of uh, when we were making this transition we would get large groups of cast members all to come together hey let's talk about the changes that are coming and we, we're going to put some images up on the screen and this is where really Another piece, another piece of communication is the five senses here. All right. So we have this. We have um, we have what we see, what we hear, what we smell, what we taste, what we touch. So in opportunities like this, you might have a big, we, we would have a big uh, like movie screen, you know, behind us. And we might show some of the art, artist um, renditions of, of the change to come. Uh, we may show uh, some videos, you know, of people talking about, you know, why they're excited about the change, things like that. So we're hitting then the five senses. And this is important as well. Why, why, why do you think it might be important to even factor this in? Yes. Sir. Everybody relates to to the information differently. Yeah, that's exactly right. How do you like to learn best? Do you know what you're learning? Your your uh, the way that you learn. I know best? I've looked into it before, but I think I'm more visual than anything. Okay, visual. Anybody like more hands on? Uh, yeah, your hands on. Okay. Anybody like to just read? Just just give me stuff to read about. I like to just read it instead. A lot of heads nodding. Okay. Uh, we're, we all learn differently. And so that's why this is important, too, because, you know, I'm a visual learner. I, I like to see things. I like to touch things. You know, I like to handle it in some way so that I can experience it. And that's how, you know, I mean, Walt Disney used to say, even your feet, even your feet send messages to your brain. I don't know if you've ever noticed this. Some of you may know this about Disney parks, but if you go like to the Magic Kingdom, when you transition from Main Street going into Adventureland, everything changes. What is it that changes? Someone, someone tell me some of the things that change. Anybody know? The music. The music changes. We go from turn of the century music, we go into now some drums, like in the jungle, you know, that are, that are drumming. Okay, we hear that. And then even the things that we're walking on, we go from, you know, like a, 
um, you know, the, the brick pavers, and we go into a wooden bridge, and then we kind of go into uh, some, some concrete that looks like soil, especially when you get over into um, like Liberty, Liberty Square and, and all of that. You've got, you've got a, lot of, um, a lot of, you know, changes not only in the music, but also in the things that, you know, the, the walkways that your, your feet are, are touching. You, you, you sense all of those things. You smell different things as well. Anything else? Anything else that you can think of that hitting all those senses? All right. Well, you're going to see a lot of people dress differently, too. You're going to see people dress differently. So they all have different costumes that kind of fit in uh, with it. <coughs> so town hall may showcase some of these things for a large audience. Well, then the, maybe the next thing that you, you have here are... Uh, round tables. And so these round tables uh, might be a cross section of different employees from different uh, lines of business that are all coming together and they all sit around this. Because, you know what, I, I would venture to say that the custodial team wants to know how this is going to impact me. What's going to be different? We're adding 20 more restaurants to what we currently have. You know, how's that going to impact us? Are we, are we uh, you know, hiring more staff? That'd be a good question to ask. And I think it's a great question for a leader to answer is that type of question. You know, um, maybe, maybe, you know, you've got, um, you've got the team that takes care of the facilities around there. Maybe they want to know, you know, how many more buildings are we building? How many more things are we planning, you know, uh, maintaining and taking care of and keeping fresh paint on? All of those things. These are all things that people want to know. Maybe the uh, merchandise or retail shops, you know, they want to know, that, are we getting new branded uh, merchandise to bring in here? All these types of questions are great questions to be asking at these round tables. And then uh, maybe something on uh, more lo location specific, you know, may take place. So uh, people that are working in their particular zones or locations may meet with their managers directly and be able to talk through, you know, these changes that are coming. Uh, we also did a lot of uh, field trips. So, um, so one of the things that, that took place was um, we brought in another vendor uh, uh, called Splitsville. And it's a bowling alley, kind of a bowling experience that people can have. And so that was not unique to Disney, but Disney went out to this vendor to seek them out to find out, you know, would, would this be, you know, something that might work in our new model. And so they would take cast members down to enjoy you know, the bowling alley and at Splitsville and other parts of the country to kind of see if this is an experience that our guests might also like. So when you think about this level of, event, of, um, of investment, when you think about this level of, uh, of investment, what do you think, how do you think the cast members or employees respond to that? Yes. Positively. And why so? Because all our needs are being met. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the questions that they have, concerns that they have, things that, you know, they're emotionally involved in, you know, they're thinking about these things and they want to know, you know, uh, how does this impact me? Any other, any other ways that you think that these things are beneficial to be doing these types of things? Yes. Probably just makes everyone feel very valued mm -hmm. and how things matter a lot. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because the, the, <clears throat> at the end of the day, you want your employees bought into not just bought in, but also invested in. That they feel like this is something exciting that I get to be a part of. This is something that they're telling me about because they want me to know. Now, if you have an employee that is excited about their work and excited about the change, the big change, the big bad change that is coming, how do you think that's gonna transfer or translate to uh, to guests or to, or to to your visitors. Yes. Yeah. I mean, increase the employee engagement, and then that employee is going to that that positivity is going to reflect, and then customers are going to see that, and then they like, buy into the vision as well. Yeah. <clears throat> Has anybody ever uh, talked with someone that just absolutely loved their job? Like, oh, uh, they love their job. All right. All right. Any, anybody been like to an Apple store? You know, I feel like every time I go in there, everybody loves their job there. They, they can't wait to show you something, you know, or talk, talk Mac to me, you know, type thing. 
You know, I mean, it, everybody that works there loves their, what, what other places besides the Apple store, you know, the people love their job? Yes, Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A, they love their job at Chick-fil-A. Why do they love their job? I don't I don't know if, <laughs> if they do or if it's just, if they're just faking it, but uh, I feel like they really like stick really, really close to their values and yeah. that they, they translate that to all of their employees. And somehow, whenever I go in there, it's just like, it's, you know, my pleasure. And then can I get you anything else? Yeah. And they, they, they love it. It's like magic. It, yeah. yeah. That chicken comes out. There's just something good about it, right? <laughs> All right. So Chick-fil-A, Apple, what else? Any other places that you can think of? Yes. Uh, Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's. Like yeah. Uh, I think they like train their cashiers to make conversation with <coughs> everyone they're checking out. Yeah. I think it would be exhausting, but it kind of it makes you think like, oh, these people enjoy being a cashier. Today. Yeah. And they'll talk to me and make people feel good. Yeah. So the, you know, they're trained to do that. Maybe it's the Joe jokes. Yeah. You know, I mean, those things are good, guys. I mean, really, the chocolate covered ones, you know, those are the best. All right, around Christmas time. All right, so yes. Now you talked about something that was important that uh, that we hadn't really, you know, discussed just yet, which is really I think the secret right. sauce. No pun intended. Intended with the Chick Fil A thing, training. Training. That's where the magic happens. Is in training. You get people excited in training about what they're doing. That's where it happens. Is right there. Now it's got to be sustained over time because you know it just it, you can't just do a one and done. Anybody ever worked for some a place that was like one and done? Had one hour of training, you know, thirty minutes, you know, two minutes, you know. <laughs> and you go, here's the cash register, go for it, you know. I mean, it's just a, a mess, an absolute mess. Right, it's a disaster waiting to happen. So, but if you've had good training, anybody been through really solid good training? Like you'd be like, oh yeah, that was good training. Do you mind sharing where that was at? Do you... Um, it was at uh, Texas Rouse, sister company. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And <clears throat> sorry. Um, I was able to get like, cross train in a bunch of other positions just because like everybody actually they didn't want they didn't want the company to look stupid. So like whenever you're not good at training, it makes people look dumb. Yeah. And then I ended up becoming a trainer and opening a couple of restaurants. So nice. They're, they're just very consistent with it. Yeah. Yeah. Did you do that here in Tennessee <coughs> or somewhere else? Um, I was down in Indy, and then I opened Storm Removal and Keystone. Oh, nice. Yeah. So they have good training. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And so, uh, and especially when you have a good trainer, like that's the other thing. And that was one of the things that I really enjoyed doing. I, I dabbled in that as well. Um, when I when I first onboarded at Disney, I didn't onboard as a as a leader there. I just I am onboarded as a frontline as a frontline employee at Disney, and then got into training with Disney very quickly. I enjoyed that immensely, being able to invest in new cast members and get them excited about the role and what they were doing. At one, at one point, I also got to work over at Disney University in the operations role uh, there, uh, kind of overseeing all the new cast members coming through you know, the university there. Lots of fun to get to do that uh, as well. But having a trainer that was excited about what they did, that's important. Anybody ever had a bad trainer? Like, oh man, they not happy. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what does that do to you when you what, what does that do to you when you had a, when you had a bad trainer? Um, I just figure it out on my own. Yeah. Yeah. Do it. And and sadly, that's what happens with a lot of companies, and then you don't have you know standard um, standardized practices at all. You know, everybody's just kind of winging it. You know, and that that's a whole other story going down that road but if you have great trainers that communicate really well and really lead well because you don't have to have a leader title to to be a leader that's an important thing that was one thing I learned at Disney too was that everybody everybody's considered a leader you didn't have to have a title to, to, to be a leader everybody uh, was considered a leader and, and the reason for that was it was through empowerment. We figured that if we gave you great training and then we provided you the right tools and resources, gave you those four keys to be kind of like your, your guiding principle, that you, you, you can't make a bad decision. 
You can't make a bad decision. There was a lot of times when I was in a leadership role and I'd be with a cast member and I was talking with them, you know, about a decision that they made. And I'd say, hey, what, what key did that support, you know, when, when you made that decision? And they'd be able to tell me, you know, which of the keys, whether it was safety, courtesy, show, or efficiency. They were able to, to share with me one of those. I think, could you have done it any differently? No. Did it just right. As long as you err on the side of our, our, our service standards, you're in good shape. You're in good shape. So that creates a great environment for people to work in. All right, so we talked about the where, like all these fun things that you can do uh, to help communicate. Going back to this, uh, the vision, you know, the clear instruction that we asked about. So all these things are important. So let's take care of uh, here. Now the how is more about like uh, the different mediums that we're going to use. Okay, so what are, what are some of the different communication mediums that, that are used today? Yes. Email. Yeah, email is one way. Okay. What else? Yes. Face to face. Face to face. So we'll say face to face. This is kind of my favorite one. Uh, we said email. Email is okay, but and I'll explain this in a minute. What else? What are some other hows? Other voice Zoom. Zoom. All right. That's good. All right. With a dog barking in the background. Always. All right. Anything else? Yes. Can I bring this up? Just because I hate it. It's what was it? I bring this one up just because I hate it. Yeah. Uh, pre recorded video. Oh, pre recorded video. Ooh. Okay. Kind of looks like it's supposed to be live, but, <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> okay, yes. Text message. Text message. Okay, that's one way for sure. What else? Oh, man, there we go. Yes. I was just going to say phone calls. Phone call. Okay, love it. All right. All right, yes. Uh, PowerPoint. PowerPoint. Okay. All right. Anything else? Yes. Like a memo? A memo. Man, you went back to a memo. Wow. All right. <laughs> yeah. A newsletter. A new and a newsletter. Okay. All right. What else? Man, you guys are on a roll now. I am surprised that no one said the one. Like this is a glaringly obvious one. Yes. Yes, there it is. Social media. <laughs> that's it. That's what I was thinking would be the first one y'all's list. Mm -hmm. All right. Like so, a, like a meeting place, like a like you know, for the software packages and like you know, your, uh, Slack and oh, Slack and okay. stuff like that. Well, what was the other? I said group me. Oh, group me. Okay. Yeah, group me. That. Yeah, that's I like that. Mm -hmm. What actually use? What is a memo? Uh, what's a memo? <laughs> All right, go for it. You got to share what a memo is. So, if I remember, if I remember correctly, it's like you have a cover page, and then your next page kind of goes over like your main points of your meeting, and then you go over into like more in depth parts of the parts of your meeting, and then there's like a conclusion that tells you why you did what you did, and then that's it. Kind of like a typed out letter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> More or less. Okay, that's true. Church bulletin, I guess. What, what was it? Like a church bulletin. A church bulletin. Okay, yeah, but I mean, that's another way that people get information. It's basically like the little pamphlets, like the sales pamphlets and stuff that they make uh, if you ever take in a sales class. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, very good. You, you guys get the picture, right? As far as all the different things. Now, let me ask you this. All these by a show of hands, and you can only choose one. Okay, you can only choose one. <laughs> I'm going to go down this list. My show of hand, which one do you prefer? Okay, which one do you prefer by a show of hand? So we'll start with social media. That is unbelievable. I cannot believe it. All right. Guys, there's a whole generation coming up behind you. <laughs> that is the only way that they communicate is through social media. That's it. All right. It's a whole, yeah. All right, this is another story. All right, here we go. Phone, my phone. Okay, one, was it one? Okay, I'm gonna go for one. All right, face to face. Wow, look at this. I love this. This is good leadership here. All right, so face to face. How many of you were in this class? I got 45. 42, you say? Mm -hmm. All right, I'm gonna go with 35, okay? I'm just gonna round it, <laughs> round it up. <laughs> All right, so, so, uh, this, this is great, and this is important. I mean, really, face-to-face -face is so good. Why do you think face-to-face -face is important? Why is that important? 
Like Ursula used to say, power of body language, right? All right, body language for sure. Yes. It takes more effort of investment. Yeah. So like, if somebody communicates something face to face, it shows that they are genuinely invested in the communication between them, yeah. rather than just typing up an email and that's it. That's right. That's right. Yes. I think it's easier to get your point across. Like you can't show emotion or yeah. excitement or anything like that with any of the others, but like when you're actually looking at somebody. Yeah. That's good. Yep. It brings in the five senses on both sides. So everyone gets to be in the same room talking to each other. Yeah. And you get to see how it's actually going instead of somebody sending a text back. Or yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I think it's so much, I think it's so much easier to clarify and act, like ask, act, like actual questions. Yeah. To ask clarifying questions. Cause that's, that, uh, anybody familiar with the five love languages? Have anybody ever heard of that? All right, anybody quality time person? Okay, we got a few in here. All right, that quality time is really where you kind of dig a little deeper and ask, you know, these qualifying que or, or clarifying questions. There's actually a, uh, the five, it's not called five love languages, because this would land you in HR jail many times, all right? But it's the five appreciation languages within the workplace. It's written by the same guy that uh, authored the five love languages, but also uh, Dr. Paul White. So the five languages of appreciation in the, in the workplace. Great book, and, and uh, Physical Touch doesn't rank as high on, on that one as, <laughs> as uh, some of the others, all right? But uh, it is great. And quality time is one of those where you spend time, you know, digging in. All right, any other comments <coughs> along why face-to-face -face is so great? Yes. Um, I, I also prefer face-to-face, -face, but I can, I've had instances where it's, you have a meeting, and the whole time you're thinking this could have been an email. Mm. I am so glad you brought that up, because that's an important thing that I was going to come to when I got to email. All right, so let's hold that. If, if I don't say it, just remind me, all right? Yes. I just wanted to defend myself on the phone. Defend yourself. <laughs> All right, go for it. Go for like, it. Like I love a good phone call because I don't have to like. I don't like seeing people's facial expressions all the time. I'm also not good at completing my own, which yeah. I need to work on. Yeah. But that's just me. But I also like how you can you can Facetime, you can text, you can call. Yeah. You can literally do anything on the phone. Like I like having the written. You said this to me yeah. this time, this day. Yeah. Also, we had a phone call and then, and you can get everything you need to get out of the way. You yeah. can also multitask rather than like yeah. having to worry about eye contact and do I look decent, stuff yeah. like that. So, I like it. So I'm gonna talk about both of your, your guys' things here in just a moment, all right? So let me ask this question on personality test. Anybody a cleric, red cleric? Have they done, have they done? Personality profiles? Like you're talking about the colors or something? Yeah, 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 you can do that one too. There's different. We've done strengths. So, just, so just strengths? Yeah. Did anybody have communication as their strength in here? Okay. All right. Great. Great. All right. So, yeah, personality profiles. There's also another great resource called I Said This, You Heard That. And, uh, and so they kind of work off of uh, the colors, all right? So, red, blue, green, and yellow. Fantastic resource. We, I'm actually using this with a healthcare group that I'm working with right now. They have, they have, they have uh, basically embedded it into the fabric of their culture, more or less. All right. Uh, so it's been it's been fantastic. So red personality is kind of a driver, you know. So they're they're gonna they're gonna blow through walls to get things done. All right. So now that I've said that, anybody kind of have that personality? Okay, a few of you. All right, all right. The memo guy, of course. <laughs> I'm just kidding with you. All right, all right. So let's come back to this because this is great. The reason why I asked about the personalities, and this is important for you to understand too, about your own personality, is it it also changes the way you communicate. So you're going to have a primary way that you're going to want to communicate based on your personality type. But that also means that as a leader, you're going to have to fight against the urge to stay in that bucket all the time. Because as we just all saw, there was a lot of people that said, I'd rather have a face-to-face. -face. So knowing your people goes back to knowing your people, knowing, uh, sharing, uh, letting them know that you care. When you know your people, you know that they would rather have a phone call. They'd be okay with an email. 
They want a memo. A memo. All right. Or they want uh, the face to face. You're going to know that. And some things may may require face to face. Some things, you know, may need, you know, any of the others. Let's talk about email. Anybody like to be communicated through email? Okay, you. All right. Two. All right. We'll go. Two. All right. Zoom. Not not many of you left at this point. Pre-recorded message. One. Oh, you were Zoom. Okay. Uh, Pre-recorded. No, not me. <laughs> All right. All right. Text. Okay, I think that's everybody. Anybody that not that I didn't call it call it out, I don't want to leave you out. Okay. You're like, well, I just prefer a newsletter. You know. Okay, that's fine too. All right. So all of these things are great ways to, to demonstrate you care, but they're all they're communication methods. Communication met methods. So you have to use them. And you'll have to adjust sometimes your overall strategy to those things. And like my friend right here was saying, this is very important that when you're communicating things over time, some things can go out in the email. If it's just a, hey, we're gonna meet at nine o'clock instead of eight tomorrow, you can, you can do a text message and an email, all right? That may be very simple, all right? Or, or you know, if it's in three days or so, you know, but if it's like within the hour, you change all something, what do you, what do you think you should do? What, what should be your communication strategy? If you have to change a location or a time to meet, what should you do? Phone call. Phone call, definitely pick up the phone. Call them. Hey, look, we're not going to be able to make it. We're going to be late. My, my grandfather, he he instilled this principle in me. You know, so if you were on time, you were late, and and you know, if you were if you were early, you were on time. That was that was how things kind of worked at, at his place. And so I knew. Now now my wife is very different. If you're on time, you're on time. So if it says be there at nine, then be there at nine. I'm like, oh man, this is going to be a killer. So I'm. Guess how many times I was calling my grandparents? We're going to be not on your time, but on, on Heather's time, all right? <laughs> we'll be there right when you told us to be there, but it won't be early. <laughs> so in, in, essentially, we'll be late and just let them know. You know, it's important to communicate that because they're ready. I mean, they got dinner out and everything. You know, they're ready, ready to eat. So, you know, you do have to, you have to factor in or, or think about all these things. All right, come back to this. This was something I want to come back to real quick here is, and I want to give you guys some time for Q&A as well, because I've been kind of going. These five senses. All right. One of the things is we were making this transition. <clears throat> we wanted to make sure the cast members could see, see the vision, see the change, why the change was going to take place, all those things. We wanted them to hear as much as they possibly could about these changes and why we're doing it. We want them to hear it. We want them to smell it. All right, you might be thinking, how in the world are you going to smell change? <laughs> how do you think we, we helped them smell it? Yes? Um, you can have a, like, like a specific scent. So like... In dating, there's yep. this thing where it's like, oh, you know, if he's coming over to your house, like bake cookies with cinnamon in it. I agree. <laughs> 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 and don't just pump the sin in there, bake the cookies, you know? <laughs> yes, all right, I love it. I love it. That's great. So the, the deal was we had a lot of different restaurants that were that were new and coming in, and one of them, one of them was a barbecue place called the Polite Pig. Guess what happened when you entered into the town hall, the foyer of the town hall? What do you think I was smelling? The pig. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> it was good. I didn't need a memo for that. I knew exactly <laughs> what I was interested in. All right. <laughs> so I got to smell it. Something different that was coming to Disney that was exciting. All right. So I got to smell it. What about taste? Naturally, it follows. Like yep, get to try it. Get to try some of these sliders, you know. Get to try some of all these other foods. Okay, this gets me excited. Uh, we have a new donut place down there called Glazed Donut. I mean, guess who signed up to be first for that? You know, I mean, that's what I'm talking about. You know, so taste it and then touch. It's about touch. What are, what are some ways to touch? Um, you might have like a a model of the building that you want, or like a model yeah. of like what the space would look like. Definitely, like there was definitely a model, that's for sure. So we, we had a full you know, rendition 
of what the new Disney Springs would look like? Or what other ways do we touch? We, we touch that sense. Yes? The environment, if it's hot, cold, humid, yeah. whatever. Yeah, that, you know, that makes all the difference too. You know, you want to make sure it's comfortable for people when they come in. Matter of fact, that's why the door's open. Rob said, you know, if we close the door, it's gonna get real hot. You know, then y'all gonna be passing out and I'm gonna have to get real excited, you know, to keep you awake, all right? Uh, what else? Anything else when it comes to taste? I'm sorry, not taste. We were down to touch. Touch. Maybe fabrics. Fabrics, exactly. Yeah, a lot of the new merchandise that was coming out, you got to touch those things. Yes? Um, technically paper, so if you had like an actual yeah. of what was happening during That's the right, some newsletters, church bulletins, all right, you're trying to think. Yeah, the, the, uh, anything that you can walk away with. One of the things that we got to walk away with, which was really cool, so the, 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 with the transition to Disney Springs also meant a new story came with it too. And so all of a sudden now, this was an a agrarian culture, you know, where oranges were harvested around the corner, you know, and there was the natural springs and all the water was bottled, you know, from it. And so uh, all that had to be, had to be trucked out of Disney Springs in some way to go to market. And the way that things ran back in the late 1800s was by a train. And so they had a nice lithograph, you know, that they had uh, done up that had, you know, the springs in the background, a train, some citrus, and they handed those out. So those are things that we took away, you know, from that. They had uh, the water bottles, not the plastic like we have today, but like the old glass, almost like the ball mason jars. You know, but after uh, the namesake of this institution here, is that they had those available for people, you know, uh, as well. And so these are things that you got to touch. Let me just tell you, you know, by the, by the end of it, all these frontline cast members, by all the different places that they got to, to go and experience the change, they were excited about it. And so when the naysayers came to you know, downtown Disney, I hear it's going to be a change, you know, oh, some dumb new name, you know, all this stuff, you know, I can't believe they're going to destroy it. I mean, Pleasure Island, that was the best place ever, you know, type thing. All those things were, are they gone? You know, their history, they've gone away, you know, they're, they're not like it used to be, uh, that type of thing. No, the cash were, oh, let me just tell you about what's coming. It's so exciting here. Try new restaurants. There's a new place called the Polite Pig that is very good. You know, you're going to love that barbecue. You're going to smell it. You know, and all these things. We're going to have this type of new merchandise, branded merchandise. You're going to get to purchase these things. These are going to be tangible memories that you're going to be able to take away with you from your experience. And boy, people just got excited. Excited about that. So the people, they, they were converted. Even though their cheese got moved, they, they, didn't, they didn't mind. They didn't mind so much. So communication is very important. The last thing I want to close out with, it actually comes back to Disney Institute. So one of the things that we used to teach when we were in insight-based uh, teaching or instruction, we talked about how uh, information, you know, how important information is coming and going. And when, when you build relationships based on trust, information flows to you. When there's no trust, it's like a dam. It just it, it gets held back. Information is held back. So communication is your tool to build and establish trust as a leader. So when we go all the way back to where we started, you know, we talked about why is communication so important within the context of leadership. It is because you are building trust through relationships. And you know how valuable that is? You can't put a number on it. Last thing I'll tell you before, before I open it up Q&A. When, um, when, when our cast members, our frontline cast members who are face-to-face -face with our guests, Start telling the stories about the changes and the new storyline, you know, at Disney Springs and, and all that. They would get pushback and they would have questions, you know, asked that they didn't know how to answer. But they would come and they would communicate that to the leadership. 
And when they came and they shared that, because there was trust, because there was trust, and there was a relationship, and we demonstrated care towards them, what would happen is, what would happen is we would be able to take that information and say, we're going to get this out. This is, this is what the guests are saying. So let's figure out how can we, how can we work through that? How can we help make sure cast members have the information they need? How, how can we make sure the guests feel comfortable with the change? And it's just like cyclical. We would share information, they would share information. We would share information, they would share information. And all that happens when you have good communication. Good communication. All right, friends, so how can I help you? What are some questions that you may have from what, what all we've talked about? Yes. Um, so obviously it like took a lot of work through communication to like do the new Disney yeah. Springs. So like what were the like was the old downtown Disney not big enough? Like what was like the like motivator for yeah. making a change like a new Great investment? Great question. Great question. All right, so our parks were hitting capacity all the time. Now to expand parks is a lot of money because it's normally an attraction that's involved in that process, right? But Disney Springs is a non-attraction based location. It's all retail. So we saw two opportunities. One, we saw a way for us to pull people from the parks to Disney Springs. That was one. The, the, second, the second thing, was, and, and that would alleviate a lot of pressure in the park, and it would also change and impact the experience that people were having in the park, because then they didn't have to wait as long of a life. But then we also knew, based on surveys, that a lot of our guests coming would do, you know, Disney a day or two, and then they would go and explore other things. Okay, they may go explore other parks like Universal, SeaWorld, whatever, and that was fine. But one of the things that came up often was shopping, like high-end retail. So you think about people that are coming here from around the world, may not have all of these different types of stores to shop at. Well, now Disney can keep you on Disney property spending money at Disney? That's a good strategy. So we've not only taken care of our efficiency piece in both, because now we're alleviating pressure in the parks and we're generating revenue in a different capacity over here. All right, great question. Yes. So you mentioned that you onboarded as like a frontline worker. Did you intend yeah. on being a cast member? Did I intend on being? What do you mean? Like, did like did you sign up to be like a like a cast member? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Not a character. Yeah. That's not, what I yeah. Mean, like yeah. a character. No. Like, no. No. Yeah. I wasn't a character. I wasn't a character. I, I am a character, but I, 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 I was not a character, a Disney character. All, right? All employees are but, cast members. Right. Yeah, okay. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. 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 Great question. Yes. Um, so the whole concept of like who, what, when, where, and sure. how. Um, I noticed that uh, Y is left out. Did um, I leave Y out? Yeah, and I don't oh, know. No, that was an accident. I didn't know if that was just baked into it or if there was a reason for leaving Y out. Why are we making the change? Yeah. Thank you for yeah. correcting me. That was perfect. Let's not forget why. Start with why, said Simon Sinek. Don't y'all know? Have you not read that book? You should read it. Start with why. All right. It's a great, it's a really where y'all go. Why are we making this change? People want to know. They want to know why are we making this change. Let's go back to your question right there. You answered the why for me. Thank you. All right. Who else? Yes. How do you know when you're over committed? Like me? Like I, mean, I ran out of time. <laughs> no, you, all right. So let me say it like this. You can never over communicate. Hear me on that. You can never over communicate. As a matter of fact, by the time you get tired of saying it, that is generally the first time most people are hearing it. That's just human nature. You can never stop communicating, especially through change. Yes? So then is there a difference between over communicating and over sharing? Or so yes, so that is true. So that gets back to this, uh, the what. So what information is shared at this level? At this level, at this level. There were certain things that we knew at this level, we could not share down here. There were things that we knew at this level that could not be shared right here. 
So, so you have to, you do have to think about what, what is it exactly I'm sharing? Because you don't want to over, uh, you, that, that wouldn't be over communicating, but that would, that would be sharing too much. Sharing too much. Yes. What's the time frame that like executives start a project and like forming the idea to yeah. it gets down to the task numbers? And okay. That's a, that's a harder question to answer. So let's just say when the idea is generated, you're not going to go, say, public internally until that thing is pretty buttoned up, all right? And so once you kind of get to that place, it, and it depends on what all the timeline is, if there's construction involved, all of those things, it, it, you just want to give yourself enough time for sure, you know? It, because you don't want to, you don't want to birth an idea too soon. If you birth an idea that hasn't been really thought out, it's a disaster. It, it is a, it's like you know, an undercooked egg. It's, it's really bad. Yes. So let's say you've done all these yeah, steps, right? Yeah. And then for whatever reason, there is a major major roadblock in, in your plan. Yeah. Right? Um, so like I can think specifically from my example, we had, I was working in a restaurant. There was going to be big changes. Mm -hmm. like we had this meeting. They, did all these things, mm -hmm. never happened. Yeah. yeah. So what kind of, like, how, how do you communicate disappointment, I guess, yeah. in that way to to prevent from losing that trust yeah. entirely? Man, that is, that is a great question. That's a great question. You know, I think as best as you can, it's sitting down with them and having the hard conversation. This did not go like we thought. We really thought it was going to go this way. Circumstances. I mean, look, we had COVID that happened. We had a recession that happened over a decade ago. I mean, all these th things happen, you know, in the world that that throw off our plans. And so I, I think just being honest with people about what happened and why it happened, I think that that's how you know that you're demonstrating care, and that's the best you can do. Yeah. Yep. Other questions? I think from the did you have a question? You want to go ahead? Oh, I had a yeah. well, I had a question, but I decided not to ask it, but I'll go ahead and ask. Yeah, it. you're you're up now. Um, so like, what, it kind of goes back to like the over communicating. Do you think that over communicating can lead to like a lack of trust? Like seeing like the employees feel like they're not being trusted in like the doing their responsibility. Okay. Okay. So, so almost like mothering. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So I, th I think it is, I think it's how it's done. I think it's how it's done. Um, that's probably the best way to handle that question. So there, there can be, and, and again, um, I do a lot of coaching as well with people. And so, uh, if you do there's something called a 360, uh, feedback, and so that means you're getting feedback from the top, from your colleagues, and down below, all right? And so when you do those assessments, you find out things like that. And then you sit down with that person and say, hey, look, I want to, I want to be very honest with you. You know, your, your feedback came back like this. This is one of the things that was highlighted. Let's talk through, you know, what, what that means. And then help them say, stop mothering people. All right, all right. any others before I turn it over? Man, you guys, y'all listen great. <laughs> that took up all my time. All right, go ahead. So, um, when you're talking to middle management, do you kind of like have to think about the fact that they're working with you guys for a level and that they're probably going to tell them more than you want to tell them? Or supposed to yeah, you, you have to tell them that. You have to say, this is not for this group of people. Yeah, very good. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Um, just to give you an example of the timelines. It could be decades. Like, Ball State with the state of Indiana is on a 20 year cycle for new buildings. 20 years. So, 15 years ago, a new business building was proposed to the state. Well, obviously, they're not going to tell you that. They don't even tell us that because it's way too early. But what they'll do is over time, they'll get input. They'll get, and so right now, we're getting close. It's a few years away, probably by the time construction decisions are made. It might be four years away.
But so some decisions, I mean, when you're talking about investing tens of millions, hundreds of millions, even billions with a B dollars, that takes. And then think about like Lucas Oil Stadium, Indianapolis. Well, they had to work with local businesses, you know, move property, buy property, move plants. I mean, it's a lot. It's it's a lot. It's there's a lot of people involved, a lot of moving parts, money. So, but thank you, John. Yeah. So, hopefully, y'all uh, got some good stuff out of that. So, I think you, it's appropriate. Yeah. You want to clap? So, uh,